14. Idleness and Revolution According to Proverbs 19.15, Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. The comment of Dean and Taylor Taswell is very revealing of the implications of this text. Quote, Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, quote, causes deep sleep to fall upon a man, end quote. The word for, quote unquote, sleep, tardoma, is that used for the supernatural sleep of Adam when Eve was formed, Genesis 2.21, and implies profound insensibility. Aquila and Symmachus render it, ecstasis, quote, trans, end quote, slothfulness, enervates a man, renders him as useless for labour as if he were actually asleep in his bed. It also enfeebles the mind, corrupts the higher faculties, converts a rational being into a witless animal. Otium est vivi hominis sepultra, quote, Idleness is a living man's tomb. An idle soul shall suffer hunger. The Septuagint here renders, quote, Cowardice holdeth fast the effeminate, and the soul of the idol shall hunger. End quote. The meaning thus is clear. Man was created in God's image to exercise dominion by means of work, knowledge, righteousness and holiness, and to subdue the earth under God. When man not only forsakes God, but also forsakes his calling and becomes a slothful, idle creature, the result is a radical deformation of man. The judgment of God then casts man into a deep sleep, an indifferent and judicial blindness to reality which destroys him. The Septuagint version makes clear a further meaning of the original. Idleness makes man effeminate. It is a renunciation of manhood. No civilization has yet existed which has not despised or condemned idleness, and yet in every culture many men including those who condemn idleness, dream of attaining it. Why this schizophrenic perspective? Hatred of the so-called idle rich, who, while real, exist more often in men's imagination than in reality, is as old as mankind. But that hatred has often been prompted by envy not only of the wealth of the rich, but also of their ability to be idle. Men see something unmanly and unbecoming in idleness, and yet they long for it. The root of this confusion lies in man's faulty dream of the Sabbath. Quote, the Sabbath was made for man, Luke 6, 5. The Sabbath was made for man in the sense that it not only had a theocratic purpose, but an anthropocentric one as well. Man's nature calls for a Sabbath, for a triumphant rest in and from his labours. Man requires the opportunity to rejoice in and celebrate his work under God. The Sabbath is an occasion for happy confidence in the fact that our, quote, labor is not in vain in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Christ is Lord of the Sabbath, not only as very God, but also as very man, as the one who brings us, as his members, into a kingdom where total success is inescapable in that all things work together for good in God for those who love him and are the called according to his purpose. Romans 8.28 Everything in man's being calls for God's Sabbath, for triumphant rest and celebration. For the ungodly, this hope poses a problem. Being under the curse because of the fall, work for them is also under the curse. Genesis 3.17-19 as are all man's activities and efforts outside of God. For them, since work is a curse, as are all things, and since in work man's daily lot, the frustration of the curse comes into continual focus, escape from work into idleness becomes the humanist's Sabbath hope. Modern man thus has turned his back on God's Sabbath in favour of idleness, which he prefers to call leisure. He deludes himself into believing that leisure is somehow creative, whereas what he means by leisure activity is usually not only not creative activity, but also not even play. It is idleness. The word he applies to 
this idleness, leisure, is very revealing. It comes from the old French laisir, to be permitted, which in turn comes from the Latin licit, it is lawful. In effect, man is saying that God's Sabbath is no longer needed and that man's flight from work and dominion into idleness is legal and allowable. One of the many differences between the Sabbath and modern leisure of idleness is that the Sabbath requires a community rejoicing in God's salvation and government, whereas leisure is inevitably solitary. A man in his leisure time may go to a baseball game with 40,000 people, but he goes and comes as an isolated person. He enters into no community with all those other men present. A man who goes to worship God with 30 people, or who reads scripture and rests with his family, does so as an individual in community or corporate life. He is able to be in community with people on the Sabbath because he has been at work under God. Those who gather together on the Sabbath without having seen each other during the week have still been a community at work together for the glory of God. Isolation in quote-unquote rest in leisure activity goes hand in hand with isolation in all things else. Society has then given way to atomistic mass man. Mass man has nothing in common with those crowding around him except proximity. He is quote the lonely crowd, end quote, alone even when group-oriented, because the foundations of community life under God and in his calling are lacking. Mass man is alone in a crowd and trusts no one. A medieval thinker, John of Segovia, held that authority in all its forms depends upon credibility and trust, upon a fundamental faith which unites men. Where men are united in their faith in God, they are more ready to trust one another and to live peaceably together. He held, he said, quote, that no state could exist without the mutual trust of men in each other in those matters which are not seen, and human society is unable to exist unless mutual trust is present, end quote. Without committing ourselves to every aspect of Segovia's thoughts, we can agree that it is an established religious authority a godly authority which makes for a social climate of peace, trust and growth. It is not necessary for men to be humanists, believing in man's supposed goodness to have a climate of mutual trust. On the contrary, humanism, by putting its trust in man rather than in God's authority, erodes society and authority and leads to distrust and trouble between man and man. Guilt, moreover, reinforces isolation in that the guilty man is marked by, first, a flight from men, in that he is anxious to escape detection. This isolation is psychological. The guilty man may be part of a crowd, he may talk or confess compulsively, but he still remains isolated and lonely. Guilt before God not only isolates a man from God, but also from other men. Second, guilt paralyzes the ability of man to work effectively so that it aggravates his discontent with life, himself and all things. Third, there is, as we have seen, no forgiveness of sins with a computer. Data banks relentlessly compile a man's records. Was he treated for venereal disease or for drug addiction at a military hospital? It is then a part of his data bank file and there is no grace to wipe out that record or his inner guilt over his past, apart from God. Sabbath and paradise are related ideas. Man seeks then in his flight, his Sabbath and paradise, in idleness. In its modern evolutionary form, primitive man supposedly had this paradise in the days before religion gave him guilt. As one Italian writer on folklore, Giuseppe Cocciara, has observed, quote, before being discovered, the savage was first invented, end quote. The so-called savage in turn believes that he long ago lost a primitive paradise. All sinners hope that this paradise will somehow become available when man is able to be idle and self-indulgent. If only man can be freed for idleness and self-indulgence, then paradise will somehow return. 
The return to paradise, in the humanistic view, means the death of history. History is the story of struggle, conflict and progress, but there is no development towards a goal, a basic aspect of history, in the anthill and the beehive. The anthill and beehive have only economics, a programme of work, not history. The humanistic dream of paradise has as a major stage an anthill society, the reduction of society to economics. Increasingly, however, the goal is that beyond this state of economic perfection, there will be a society beyond economics, a world of perfect idleness and delight. Some versions of this hope hold that automation will give birth to this work-free world. Others are not as specific, as witness Henry Miller and others, who expect this humanistic utopia to arrive by massive copulation rather than by economics. All this has given humanistic man an ambivalent attitude towards history. Eliade makes some important observations on modern man's interest in history. Quote, We need only instance one of the most specific features of our own civilization, namely the modern man's passionate, almost abnormal interest in history. This interest is manifested in two distinct ways, which are, however, related. First, in what may be called a passion for historiography, the desire for an ever more complete and more exact knowledge of the past of humanity. Above all of the past of our Western world, Secondly, this interest in history is manifested in contemporary Western philosophy and the tendency to define man as above all a historical being conditioned and in the end created by history. What is called historicism, historismus, historicismo, as well as Marxism and certain existentialist schools, these are philosophies which, in one sense or another, ascribe fundamental importance to history and to the historic moment. Let us now look at this passion for history from a standpoint outside of our own cultural perspective. In many religions, and even in the folklore of European peoples, we have found a belief that, at the moment of death, man remembers all his past life down to the minutest details and that he cannot die before having remembered and relived the whole of his personal history. Upon the screen of memory, the dying man once more reviews his past. Considered from this point of view, the fashion for historiography in modern culture would be a sign portending his imminent death. It is in trying to estimate this anguish in the face of death, that is, in trying to place it and evaluate it in a perspective other than our own, that the comparative approach begins to be instructive. Anguish before nothingness and death seems to be a specifically modern phenomenon. In all the other non-European cultures, that is, in the other religions, death is never felt as an absolute end or as nothingness. It is regarded rather as a rite of passage to another mode of being, and for that reason, always referred to in relation to the symbolisms and the rituals of initiation, rebirth or resurrection. This is not to say that the non-European does not know the experience of anguish before death. The emotion is experienced, of course, but not as something absurd or futile. On the contrary, it is accorded the highest value as an experience indispensable to the attainment of a new level of being. Death is the great initiation. But in the modern world, death is emptied of its religious meaning that is why it is assimilated to nothingness, and before nothingness, modern man is paralysed. End quote. We can dissent from this brilliant analysis by citing the views of ultimate nothingness in Far Eastern philosophies and religions. In these faiths, life itself is regarded as meaningless, and death is, as a result, an escape and a relief from karma. Western thought still retains a biblical love of life, and as a result, death is a threat to it. History, however, is seen by the humanists as a brief and recent episode in the cosmic blindness. History is studied for a clue to provide meaning or escape, and history is also resented because, from a humanistic perspective, 
it culminates in certain death and a cosmic silence. There is thus an intense concern about history and a desire to end history and institute an anti-historical and revolutionary regime which prevents life from moving and disappearing, which attests time into a paradise of idleness. Because history means conflict and struggle towards a goal, it means freedom to pursue or to renounce that goal, it means good and evil, rewards and punishment. This, however, is not to the taste of those who forsake manhood for idleness. They do not want freedom. They want the perfection of a sinner's paradise where there is no judgment, no consequences, no work and no death, only idleness in which to experience pleasures. A psychologist, Dr. John H. Flaum, gives us his version of this utopia in his Delightism. He declares that, quote, the world is coming to a beginning, end quote, a new genesis, the age of delight. It will involve the group enjoyment of sensuality. He provides us with many aphorisms, a thousand alone in the back of his book, to summarize the wisdom of this new age, quote, good is feeling good. Sex has become safer than ping pong. Pornography inspires delight. The way you smell is as important as what you think, end quote. He prescribes, quote, orgy therapy, end quote, and fun as a cure for man's ills and as a means to reaching the age of delightism. Because the world of delightism, post-historical man, utopia, or whatever else humanists choose to call it, lacks any sense of history, it is out of touch with reality. It belongs to the realm of fantasy and dreams. It is the world of idle imagination. Such a state of mind is also revolutionary. The revolutionist is intensely absorbed in history. He rages against its meaning and direction, its problems and tensions, and he studies history with a passionate rage. At the same time, he wants to destroy history. He is insistent that the world of purpose and consequence can be wiped out and nullified and replaced by a revolutionary regime which is dedicated to the dream of paradise as idleness. Thus, both idleness and the dream or hope of idleness put man out of touch with the world of reality and imbue him with a revolutionary hostility against it. Revolutionary movements are uniformly hostile to religion and are dedicated especially to militant hostility against biblical revelation. There is a necessary reason for this. Revelation is the communication to man of God's will and purpose, and it is set down in the inscriptured word. This revelation not only declares God's sovereign claims on man, but also charts the purpose of God for man in history. Man is to exercise dominion and to subdue the earth under God by means of God's law word. For man to do this means that man must believe that God is, quote, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, end quote, Hebrews 11.6. The revolutionist, however, begins by denying God and God's declared meaning of history. The meaning and the rewards are of, by, and for man. Revolution is the communication and attempted imposition by man of man's own determined meaning on the world and time. It seeks to arrest history by means of revolution and imposes man's will on a seemingly blind and meaningless flux. The revolutionist denies God and is at war with God. The alternative to God is logically a blind and meaningless flux or change, and the revolutionist is in turn at war against that. Against God and chaos, he asserts man and man's world. He seeks, like God, to possess aseity, self-being, to be the only Lord and Creator and to be self-existent. Pretty quickly, his grandiose world of aseity becomes delightism, idleness and suicide. As Christ, speaking as wisdom, declared long ago, quote, He that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. Proverbs 8.36
The implication, moreover, of the Septuagint version of Proverbs 19.15 is correct. There is a deeply rooted cowardice and flight from life and idleness. It is an unwillingness to accept life because it has problems. This unwillingness has its roots in the refusal to accept the basic problem, man's sin. When man refuses to accept the last of his sin, he thereby precludes salvation from that sin. By his sin, man was cast out of paradise and separated from God's Sabbath because he had denied the work God had called him to perform. With the calling of a chosen people, the Sabbath was reintroduced into history together with the law and the establishment of a plan of dominion. Man's dreams of a paradise of idleness are futile efforts to re-enter Eden, which in reality became a storming of the gates of hell, where man indeed has idleness and isolation as well. A 17th century English broadside ballad, quote, An invitation to Lubberland satirised the dreams of paradise held by the idol. There's nothing there but holidays with music out of measure. Who can forbear to speak the praise of such a land of pleasure? There you may lead a lazy life, free from all kinds of labour, and he that is without a wife may borrow of his neighbour. The point is well made. The idol are parasites, and in a real paradise the human parasites have no place. Moreover, Levin is correct in stating that, quote, the Edenic impulse has been at odds with the utopian impetus. Eden, as a social goal in American life, has led to work. The utopian impulse is a flight from work into parasitism. Levin cited also Thoreau's distaste for the book of a German technocrat, J. E. Etzler's The Paradise Within Reach of All Men, because it offered salvation and paradise by means of labour-saving devices. Thoreau, very much the Puritan at this point, commented, quote, This is paradise to be regained, and that old and stern decree at length reversed. Man shall no more earn his living by the sweat of his brow. All labour shall be reduced to, quote, a short turn of some crank, end quote, and, quote, taking the finished articles away, end quote. But there is a crank. Oh, how hard to be turned. Could there not be a crank upon a crank, an infinitely small crank? We would fain inquire. No, alas not. But there is a certain dim energy in every man, but sparingly employed as yet, which may be called the crank within, quite indispensable to all work. Would that we might get our hands on its handle. In fact, no work can be shirked. It may be postponed indefinitely, but not infinitely. Nor can any really important work be made easier by cooperation or machinery.